So let's get stuck into the Sunday papers with Tom Harwood, GB News's deputy political editor. Tom, lovely to see you this morning. You're putting in a shift, aren't you, eh? We're basically working six or seven day weeks here. I'm, I'm working a 12 day week this week. Love that. Um, but Love no, that. it's a general election. I wouldn't be dreaming of being anywhere else. And with stories like this, Tom, <laughs> we can't resist. So we've chosen the mail on Sunday. They're basically going, because it's a right-leaning paper, mm. I think the right-leaning papers are having a bit of a struggle, aren't they? Because it's quite hard to support the Conservatives as they are imploding, and a lot of their readers are very angry with the Tories. Mm. But you've also got the situation with reform inevitably leading to a supermajority for Labour, because there are certain seats where a vote for reform is a vote for Labour. I don't care what Nigel Farage and Richard Tice say about this. That's true. So mm. the Mail on Sunday have done this um, kind of chart suggesting where a vote for reform will cause a Starmageddon. Mm. Actually, that's borrowing from Richard Tice's play. It is, Starmageddon. So let's look at some of these seats, because it's where some of the big beasts, like Mel Stride, for instance, could be upended. We've got talk in other polls about Penny Mordaunt not being safe. Mm. I read something last night saying Rishi Sunak might not even be <laughs> safe in Richmond in North Yorkshire. That is on the very outer bounds <laughs> of, the, uh, of, of the polls there. But um, even in the the Salvation MRP poll. Now, these are the huge sort of 20,000 plus what's known as multi-level uh, post-stratification and regression analysis polls. That's good for um, a Sunday morning, Tom. Well done. <laughs> which are um, in incredibly complicated seat by seat analysis. But even in that uh, Salvation MRP poll that shows 73 seats, just 73 seats from the for the Tories down from 365 in 2019. Crazy. Even in that, Rishi Sunak does keep his seat. But Penny Mordaunt doesn't and James Cleverley doesn't. No. So it's just, what's your theory on why the polls haven't moved at all? Mm. Because I know there are undecideds and there are certainly very disgruntled. Um, but at the same time, Labour's vote share is also going down as mm. people splinter off towards reform and the Lib Dems, right? Yes. So we've got the prospect now of Labour sort of walking into this supermajority on the basis of a lower vote share mm. than Tony Blair ever won in 1997 with his landslide. It's, it's remarkable, isn't it? But if we look to the Prime Minister in a general election who won the highest number of votes in British history, no one surpassed him in this. Do you know who it was? John Major. John Major in 1992. Which is crazy. Which is, so we're which is crazy to, lose it. to think about it. But yeah. it's because the turnout was high, and of course the gap between Labour and the Conservatives was small. And that's what matters. It's not the ultimate share, it's the gap. Yeah. So if. Uh, Keir Starmer is on 38%. Now, that's that's five points lower mm. than Boris Johnson. That's six points lower than Boris Johnson mm. got in 2019. It, it doesn't matter that that's lower because the Tories are even further behind because of that split in the right wing vote. So it's, it's easy to see why the Mail on Sunday is putting out uh, pictures like this, yes. showing where the split is different. What Nigel Farage says, however, is that there are now seven seats in the latest Salvation poll that reform has winning. And Nigel Farage says that this is only growing. So it could be the data that we're looking at is already out of date. But of course, even in that scenario where the Tories are on 70 something and reform is on seven, mm. it's easy to see in a lot more seats, the split would be voting for reform rather than voting for the Tories. Do you believe the MRP polling? Because that's the kind of most catastrophic picture that's painted by the pollsters mm. of as we say this, we're calling it kind of conservageddon. Mm. The whole party's destroyed. It's a bit like 1993 in Canada. Yes. But yet we do see other polls. I remember that one by JL Partners, which was admittedly before the D-Day debacle. Mm. But that put Labour just 12 points ahead of the Conservatives. Yeah. So there's such a huge amount of disparity in all of these polls. There is. However, 12 points ahead is, is similar to what Tony Blair won in 1997. So even in that scenario, yeah. we're looking at 160 seats for the Tories. Yes. That's them losing more than half their seats. So none of these polls show anything other than a landslide victory for the Labour Party. Now there's debate, JL Partners, for example, they redistribute the don't knows yes. in terms of likely voting intention. So they sort of do They're some... second guessing don't know as exactly. if they do decide to come out. And, and they sort of predict that don't knowers will probably break towards the government if that's what they voted for last time. Mm. There's a lot of complicated maths that goes on behind all of these polls. But the thing is, there is isn't a single poll that says 
that we're in hung parliament territory, no. that we're in Tory majority territory. No. All of the polls say there'll be a Labour landslide. The only disagreement is, is this a 1997-style Labour landslide? Or, as you keep mentioning, the Canada 93 situation where the Tories, uh, the Canadian Progressive Conservative Party, as it was then, led by Kim Campbell, went from the party of government with an absolute mm. majority in the Canadian House of Commons to just two seats. I mean, Stephen Harper, who was then the Conservative party leader. Subsequently, I think it took him 13 years mm. to recover this situation. And, and a party merger. The Progressive yes, Conservative yes, Party died, reform. Uh, reform merged with it, and they created the Conservative Party of Canada. But, but do you think Power just based cycles. his whole approach on the Canadian picture so that he can start rising like a phoenix from the flames, from the ashes mm. of the Conservatives? Is that his game plan, do you If think? that is his game plan, he will be a very old man indeed before he even has yes. a whiff of power. He'll be well into his 70s. Although he's younger than Keir Starmer, which is the stat of this election, I think. Keir Starmer's 61, Farage is 60. There's, a, there's quite a good game that political journalists are playing, which is can you name celebrities that are actually... Uh, older than Keir Starmer, but that seem younger. It seems that Keir Starmer looks a lot like younger than he is. And yes. there are lots of celebrities who you'd think are in their 40s who are actually older than Keir Starmer Which now. Which is weird. But, um, but, but yes. Has he had a good week? I mean, let's just look at The Observer. The mm. Observer are the ones who are talking about this um, idea of Labour being on course for the lowest combined, uh, the Tories and Labour being on course for the lowest combined share of votes since 1945. Mm. And expressing a bit of concern, I think there is some concern about whether Keir Starmer will have that mandate. I'm just reminded of the Brexit referendum. And because it was so close, because it was 40, uh, 52 to 48, mm. lots of people said on the Remain side, oh, well, we don't have a mandate for hard Brexit because it's a close result. Mm. So, well, if you're going to apply that to Labour, getting a super majority on the back of a lower vote share than Tony Blair, so more seats for less in a way, then are we then able to argue we can't have, pardon the pun, hard Labour for 10 years? <laughs> well, I, I suppose it would be an argument and it would be a, a consistent argument with the way that people in the Remain campaign argued after they lost the vote. However, of course, people in the Leave campaign said, well, a majority is a majority. A majority, that's democracy. And that is democracy. Yeah. And there is untrammeled power for a parliamentary majority yeah. in our system. It's uh, what Lord Hailsham called an elective dictatorship because yes. we don't have a separate executive and legislature like they do in the United States where the president can be one party and Congress can be different parties as well. Yes. In our country, it's all the same. If you're the prime minister and you have a big majority, you can change any law you want to. Although, I mean, I might speak to Philip Diamond about this in a moment, the guy who wrote the manifesto for Labour in 2005 and 10. Is it actually... Uh, Patrick Diamond, sorry. Mm. Is it actually difficult for a leader to have such a big majority because then you've got unwieldy backbenchers mm. doing all sorts and you and don't have much control? There's one thought that I was thinking earlier in the week when we were looking at the G7 in Italy with those seven party leaders, uh, seven prime ministers and presidents, almost uniquely unpopular. Each one of them yes. in each country, left and right. Yeah, the Telegraph did uh, something on this. Is this the most unpopular group of G7 leaders in history? And it's easy to Their see poll why. Ratings were Justin in the Trudeau in Canada, yes. double digits behind in yes. the polls. Olaf Scholz in Germany, double digits behind in the polls. Emmanuel Macron losing to the far yeah. right in France. Uh, of course, Rishi Sunak here, Joe Biden in the United States. Yeah. Wherever you look, incumbent governments in Western countries, they've faced high interest rates, high taxes, had a bout of high inflation. And that is the uh, political cocktail, the economic cocktail mm. that is leading whichever party the incumbent comes from, the uh, opposition are rising in the polls. Yes. That's a clue for actually Keir Starmer when he gets into office. Yeah, be careful Does what you wish suddenly for. <laughs> the shine come off? And is it actually right now the worst job in politics? Also, he didn't really expect to be prime minister. He thought he was going to be in a holding pattern while Boris Johnson sort of, you know, lambasted around the world stage for 10 years. Um, Let's have a quick chat about the resident royal trooper at yes. Trooping. Kate's back. She is. And didn't she look marvellous? She looks... <laughs> <laughs> that is such a royal phrase. Isn't she amazing? The point is, she's channeling her inner Audrey Hepburn there. Yes. It's all very my fair lady. We can't put too much pressure on the princess because, as she said in that statement, Tom, she's had good days and bad days. I mean, if this was a bad day, I'd love to have a bad day as bad as this because she looks phenomenally good. But it kind of warms the cockles because a lot of the news at the moment is a bit 
gloomy. It is. And even the weather was gloomy, but I think she shone through. Yes. Um, but, but isn't it interesting, the choices that were made there, sort of channeling My Fair Lady, Audrey Hepburn, what are they trying to say about that? Is, was Kate Middleton... Um, once a commoner once and a now... Commoner, and marbles in her mouth, gargling well, and, and, and changing she from never her had Cockney mar- accent. She never had marbles in her mouth, <laughs> although there was that quite unfortunate criticism of the fact that Carol, her mother, Middleton, mm. was an air hostess. And a, you know, well, she well, the rain in Spain does Manuel. stay mainly on the plane. <laughs> I love the way that you've said that. Also, a quick word, Tom. I know you love your football. <laughs> I know you're absolutely drilled into this. But the Euros, may they also bring some welcome cheer to this sorry state of affairs where we're in a June that is the sun isn't shining. Everyone's probably had it up to here with electioneering. <laughs> Can we celebrate the football? England versus Serbia tonight. Will you be watching? Um, I, I, might, I might tune in for a bit. I, I just hope... <laughs> I just hope that England does better than Scotland did well, on Friday. We uh, all hope that. I, I, I know that Keir Starmer missed out on watching the Scotland game. Oh, bless him. And called it dreadful. Oh, really? Well, at least he didn't make a Rishi Sunak mistake and think that Wales were at the Euros <laughs> when they didn't qualify. That was a bit of a boo-boo. Tom Harwood, thank you for working so hard. Try and get some rest today, for goodness sake, because I'll Not no doubt seconds. see you tomorrow as well <laughs> when I'm on the 7 o'clock hour and you're on the 8 o'clock hour. Lovely to see you, though. Thanks for coming in.